So welcome to unit seven, cognition. We have a very short <clears throat> module today, module 34. It's very interesting though. Thinking concepts and creativity. It's actually one of my favorites. So only two learning targets for this module. Define cognition and describe the functions of concepts. And the second one, discuss the factors associated with creativity and describe some ways of fostering creativity. Probably all of us are so interested in what can we do to be, be more creative? Who, what makes someone creative, number one, but what can we do to foster our own creativity? Definitely something I'm fascinated with. So just for a moment, let's talk about what is cognition in general? So it's all of the mental activities associated with thinking, knowing, remembering, and communicating. And a big idea within cognition is what are concepts? So concepts, what is that? We use that term all the time, but what is concepts? What does that really mean <clears throat> within the field of psychology? Concepts are mental groupings of similar objects, events, ideas, or people, okay? So things like we have a concept of what furniture is, or dogs are, or what flowers are, okay? <laughs> or, or chairs are, according to this little meme right here. Right? We all have a concept. They're, those chairs aren't all the same, but they all fit under our concept of what a chair is. On the other hand, a prototype is a mental image or best example of a category. So while chairs can come in all shapes and sizes, modern models and the antique creations, the basic four-legged chair, you know, a chair with a back, <clears throat> often serves as sort of our prototype, what we think of, when we think of chairs, okay? So um, in the textbook, again, if you're following along with Meyer's Psychology for the AP Course Third Edition, they talk about, you know, a robin being a birdier bird than a penguin, right? When we think of what, a, when we think of the word bird, we probably don't immediately think of something like a penguin, even though it's a bird. We think of something more like a robin or something like that, because it's just a more common example. It's a proto, our, our prototype of what a bird is. And I think a really interesting way to think about differentiating what a prototype is from a concept. So a prototype is sort of a stereotype of that concept. When we think of a particular concept, we have a stereotype for what that concept is, and that is the prototype. Or as a concept in general, it's just sort of our schema for something. And we're gonna talk more about schemas when we get into um, our unit on developmental psychology. So how do prototypes help form concepts? Matching new items to a prototype provides a quick and easy method for sorting items into categories or concepts, okay? So we're, we have these concepts and prototypes as a way to make our understanding of the world more efficient. So concepts help us understand our world. So we can more quickly kind of make sense of what's going on around us by having these concepts, these categories and then having these prototypes that we utilize when we're thinking about the concepts. So how do we categorize people? This is another really interesting thing to think about. And in the textbook, again, there's a really interesting example. Um, these faces are sort of a computer um, simulation of a 90% Caucasian face all the way to a 90% typically Asian face um, that is described in detail within the textbook and you can see when they, and these are just, these are just, again, stereotypes, typical, typical characteristics of um, these different categories. And you can see um, changes in, in the way the, the faces are looking based on these um, changes in different features. So when we categorize people, we mentally shift them toward our category of prototypes. Okay, and at what point do we sort of see them in one way versus another? When Belgian students viewed a blended face in which 70% of the features were Caucasian, as you can see there in the 70% CA face right there, and 30% were Asian, the students categorized the face as Caucasian. However, if shown a 70% Asian face, as you can see in the 70% AS, face right there, the student later remembered a more prototypically Asian face, okay? 
So what happens when events, people, or items do not match our prototypes, the stereotypes of those concepts? When symptoms don't fit one of our disease prototypes, we are slow to perceive an illness. So um, an example of that is like heart attacks. You know, we have certain things that we think of, people whose heart attack symptoms, like shortness of breath, exhaustion, dull weight in the chest, that doesn't match with what, with what their heart attack prototype might be. Like, oh, what we've seen in, what we've seen in movies, a sharp chest pain. And so they might not seek help. So that can be really problematic. So while prototypes can help us um, navigate the world easier in some, in some ways, they can also you know, hurt us literally by not letting us identify that we're potentially have a serious illness. When behaviors don't fit our discrimination prototypes, of white against black, male against female. You know, we have some of those in general, there's um, more prototypes of those going on within many people. Young against old, we often fail to notice prejudice if it's happening in the, re in the reverse way. So now shifting gears a little bit to creativity. So we hear that term all the time and we all wanna be working hard to improve our creativity, but what is creativity? So there's so much information out there. This is, there's such an interest in understanding creativity and how we can improve our creativity, but what is it? It's the ability to produce both novel, new, and valuable, useful ideas. So it isn't just coming up with as many new things as possible. They have to both be new ways of thinking about something and something that's a useful way of thinking about something. When we think about our thinking, there are two different kinds that are, you know, we often have this dichotomy of our thinking. Convergent thinking, narrowing and avail the available problem solutions to determine the single best solution. This is generally most types of tests like the SAT or um, standardized tests in general are usually focused on convergent thinking as opposed to divergent thinking. So divergent thinking is expanding the number of possible solutions. So this is thought of as the more creative type of thinking that expands in different directions. So it's like, how many uses can you come up with for something? Um, more open-ended, expanding the number of possible directions, solutions for something. So again, the SAT or other types of aptitude tests typically require convergent thinking, an ability to produce a single correct answer, whereas divergent thinking would be more like typical creativity tests. How many uses can you think of for a brick? Um, those require divergent thinking, the ability to consider many different options and to think in those new novel ways. So what are the components that go into creativity? So according to Robert Stern, Sternberg, a very famous psychologist who's done a lot in the area, study in the area of intelligence too, um, he has come up with uh, he and his colleagues have kind of identified five different components of creativity, expertise, imaginative thinking skills, a venturesome personality, intrinsic mo motivation, and a creative environment. So in terms of expertise, you have to have a knowledge base in a particular area. You're not going to be able to think creatively about, you know, um, <laughs> nuclear physics if you don't have the background in nuclear physics. You have to have some expertise in an area as sort of the starting point to be able to be creative in that area. Imaginative thinking skills, just being able to look beyond um, you know, what typically is happening in the real world, being able to imagine different instances of things happening. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about a venturesome personality. In this next slide, a venturesome personality seeks new experiences, tolerates ambiguity, um, it can have uncertainty. Someone who's venturesome can deal with a little bit of uncertainty and take risks and persevere in overcoming obstacles. So as an example, Princeton mathematician Andrew Wiles pondered for more than 30 years a mathematical puzzle left by Hermant, a 17th century mischievous mathematical genius. Wiles said he labored in near isolation from the mathematics community, partly to stay focused and to avoid distraction. Okay. So you have to have a little bit of a, this different type of personality as one of the components to be able to come up with really creative ideas. How about that imaginative thinking? So cartoonists often display creativity as they see things in new ways or make unusual connections. Being able to kind of look at the same thing that everybody else is looking at and viewing it in a different way and seeing connections between things in a different way. 
you can see this funny meme right here. I'm, I'm assuming uh, <laughs> it's, it's a really funny little cartoon. And cartoonists usually are really good at making connections in ways that are just absolutely amusing and ways that most people aren't thinking about them, that, but that do make sense to other people when they really think about it. So what can you do to boost your creativity? So you can develop your expertise. You have to have that strong general fund of information, that knowledge base. You have to allow time for incubation. Think hard on a problem. You may not have 30 years <laughs> like the mathematician, but think hard on a problem. Don't think, don't think, oh my gosh, if I don't come up with creative thought right now, I'm never going to come up with creative thought. Sometimes it takes time. It takes up time for these ideas to incubate and grow. Um, set aside time for your mind to just roam freely. Don't be busy all the time. Um, make sure that you give yourself time just be doing nothing, right? Like just having time to relax because interestingly, neuroscience is showing us that having a lot of time to just relax and do nothing can actually spark your creativity. And finally, experience other cultures and ways of thinking. There's some interesting information in your textbook about um, traveling abroad or things like that actually igniting creativity because you start looking at things in different ways than you did previously. And the, the funny meme of this picture is the creative environment being the shower. And you'll hear this over and over again from creative people. Why is it that we often come up with really good ideas when we're in the shower or we're relaxed? You know, we're, we're just kind of not focused usually on something that's super stressful, rushing to get out the door, all those kind of things. And it actually helps um, ignite our creativity. So we are back to our learning targets already. So defining cognition and describing the functions of concepts. Cognition refers to all the mental activities associated with thinking, knowing, remembering, and communicating. We use these concepts, mental groupings of similar objects, events, ideas, or people to simplify our world. The reason we use concepts is to simplify our world, to make things easier and faster to navigate. We form most concepts around our prototypes or our best examples of a category. Remember, like a Pro, good example of a prototype when you're trying to think about what that concept mean, means is this silly way of thinking of a robin is sort of a birdier bird than a penguin. So what are the factors associated with creativity and fostering creativity? So creativity, again, the definition is the ability to produce both novel, new, and valuable or useful ideas. It is supported by a certain level of aptitude, but aptitude tests often require convergent thinking whereas creativity tests require divergent thinking. Robert Sternberg and his colleagues have proposed that creativity has five major components, expertise, imaginative thinking skills, venturesome personality, intrinsic motivation, which we didn't talk about much in this module, but we did in the previous modules, um, and a creative environment that sparks, supports, and refines creative ideas. Okay, and that is it for today. Uh, thank you for listening and take care.